Good day, everybody. Emmett Kilduff here, the CEO of the Fortier Group. Um, we are having some uh, technical difficulties of people um, logging on, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, I'll do some uh, talk about some housekeeping um, and then present the Fortier Group's presentation. By that time, hopefully, more guests will be on and all the panelists and speakers will be on. Um, so uh, very welcome everybody back to our uh, first webinar of 2023. We started doing these webinars in October 2021 um, and look forward to uh, a nice um, selection of topics as we go through this year, starting off with, you know, the timing, the outlook and um, the question on everyone's uh, you know, lips at the moment is, is now a good time to sell, is now a good time to buy. Um, so that's what we'll address in, in today's um, today's webinar. So let's get started. So um, for those that don't know uh, myself or my colleagues at the Fortier Group, our sole focus is uh, e-commerce exits. That's all we do and think about every day. Uh, we help e-commerce entrepreneurs um, get the best exits, be they FBA entrepreneurs, DTC entrepreneurs, or any other type of e-commerce entrepreneurs, for example, you know, um, e-commerce technology related uh, businesses. So um, that's our sole focus. Please reach out if you'd like to um, have a discussion. Um, last week, we had a super event in New York. Part of the focus allows us to do really laser focused niche type events and content. A uh, great example is last week, we had a thought leadership discussion, roundtable discussion and dinner with about 20 aggregators. So we did a three hour agenda that we went through, which was a discussion. It wasn't, it wasn't death by slides. It was a discussion of, of, of all the things uh, aggregators are thinking about. And the output uh, summary of that event will be published uh, on a blog or article in the um, coming weeks. Um, so for those of aggregators or buyers of e-commerce brands, you'll find that interesting, but sellers will also find that interesting as well, because ultimately it's, it's good to understand the buyer that you will ultimately sell to, if indeed it's an aggregator, it could well be private equity or strategic. Um, that was last week. Today, we've been very busy. Today, we published um, an article um, about the factors that influence timing. Uh, it's really important to get timing right. Um, timing is everything in business. And um, again, the question we get a lot from, from sellers is now a good time to sell. And obviously, there's lots of uh, components to that question, and we'll, we'll try to answer a few of those during today's call. But we, we published an article. You can get it from our website, and, and you can read it um, at your letter. Uh, next week, again, we've been very busy. Uh, we are going to publish uh, the best exit guide for TTC entrepreneurs worldwide. Uh, some of you will know that we've done a similar document for FBA entrepreneurs, which we published about 18 months ago. Edition one was published 18 months ago, and every sort of six months or so, we publish a new edition to make sure that they're all relevant and up to date. Um, it's not just the Fortier Group uh, uh, drafting all the content, we bring in experts. Um, so for this uh, guide, we have nine actual acquirers contributing content. We have law firms, experts, entrepreneurs, and um, it will be ready next week. And we look forward to um, distributing it to everyone that's on this live call and it'll be available for download uh, on a complimentary basis from, from our website. Um, what does it cover? Covers uh, the A to Z of, of uh, thinking about an exit. First of all, you've got to understand buyers. Uh, what do they want? What are they looking for across different types of buyers, um, whether it be a, uh, an aggregator, DTC, or otherwise uh, private equity or corporates. Uh, how to become exit ready, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. We're uh, big believers in, in preparing for an exit as far out as you can. Um, what the exit process entails, how to think about financials, legals, etc. cetera. Um, uh, valuation, um, uh, what we're seeing from a valuation perspective. Uh, we'll touch on a little bit of that today, but there's, 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 there's a whole section uh, which, I've, which I've written um, in, in the guide. Um, so um, hope, hope uh, all the DCC entrepreneurs enjoy, enjoy that read. For FBA specific entrepreneurs, um, if you haven't uh, looked at it already, please download our FBA specific guide um, from the fortiagroup.com. Um, we've done about 15 of these types of webinars. Um, you can uh, see uh, th them all on our YouTube channel. Just put in the fortiagroup to youtube.com. Uh, all the recordings are there. 
you know, the top left was one of my favorite ones in June last year. We had um, uh, uh, several CEOs of aggregators discuss the future of the space. Um, we'll do that topic again, maybe later in the year. Uh, but the content's all there. You can subscribe to the channel so that you get a, an alert as soon as the video or the recording, excuse me, goes live. Typically, we have five to ten x of people that actually attend our live webinar. Um, uh, you know, watch it, watch it on recording at their leisure, especially in Q4 when it's obviously incredibly busy, busy time for e-commerce folks. Um, uh, all of the webinars we've done since day dot uh, are always demand led. It's not for Tia Group, um, you know, preaching about what the topic should be. Um, it's you guys telling us what you want us to talk about. And so with that in mind, I'm going to set um, a poll in a moment uh, to ask you what you'd like us to discuss. Um, we've put six suggestions here and we've given the opportunity for you to come up with other suggestions. So, so press other if you, if you want to discuss something else and uh, please do kindly during the webinar, submit that topic to us via the exits at the fortiagroup.com. So uh, top left, earnouts, a deep dive. Um, uh, you know, there's always, there's always, you know, uh, pros and cons to earnouts, different views from sellers and buyers. Um, there has been litigation uh, with two aggregators, SellerX and Perch, in the recent months. And so it's a question on a lot of sellers' minds. Um, so we'll look at the structure, we'll look at the litigation, and it's all with the view to trying to have transparent and fair earnouts for both sides of any deal. It has to be a win-win for both sides. So I think that's quite timely. Um, going across the top, sources of capital. Um, a lot of VCs have left the e-commerce space post the iOS changes last year. That puts a lot of companies in a difficult position. Um, some of the credit providers, such as revenue-based funding companies, have, have, have had a tough time in the last sort of six months or so. Um, so what are all the sources of capital, both equity and credit? Um, we'll map them all out for you and um, we can get various providers to come on and we can talk about the, the pros and cons. So if that's of interest, please vote for that. Um, recurring revenue, really key, particularly probably easier or relatively easier for DTC entrepreneurs to, to have higher recurring revenue. It's a massive driver of value. We want to do a deep dive. We want to suggest a deep dive to show you, you know, the impact re recurring revenue can have on, on your valuations. A uh, hundred million dollar club, We've done seller stories before. We're, we're proposing to go big and have a handful of sellers who've reached that, that magic number of $100 million uh, exits uh, to come on and discuss, discuss how they did it and what their lessons learned were. Um, becoming exit ready is something we, we talk about all the time. Too many entrepreneurs just jump into the exit process. That's not the right way to go about it. That's not what an SP or a FTSE company would do. Uh, you need to plan one to two years out, ideally, or at least at least for six months. So um, to make it sort of simple and, and, and for some prioritization, we're, we're going to map out the top 10 tasks and our items on a checklist to become exit ready. That's an, another suggestion from the team. And then finally, um, MOA, mergers of aggregators. Uh, this has been discussed a lot last year. Um, it's definitely going to kickstart in H1 this year because some aggregators will go bust and, and some are distressed and, and for various reasons. Um, it's important, obviously, for the aggregators to sort of be on top of that topic, but also for sellers. Um, you need to, be, you need to you know, be, be interviewing the buyers, making sure they're going to be around um, and doing due diligence on the buyer. It's a two-way DD process and, and um, understanding the landscape of aggregators is, is I think, we think helpful for, for sellers. And aggregators can be both FBA aggregators and DTC aggregators. Today, we have a great mix of both uh, speaking on, on the webinar. Again, if you'd like to um, suggest another suggestion, please do so and email, uh, email us at exits at the Fortier Group. Okay, so that's the background. Let me launch the poll now. Hopefully you can all uh, see the questions and um, I'll give that, you know, 30, 30 seconds or a minute to um, allow you to respond. <clears throat> I 
Okay, so um, the number one request is sources of capital, equity and credit. Really interesting. Obviously, people are looking at ways to grow. Um, so that was number one. Number two, recurring revenues, impact and valuation. And number three, the $100 million club, learning from big sellers. So thank you for that feedback. That'll be the, they will be, excuse me, the topics for the next three months. Okay, um, today is all about the outlook for e-commerce M&A in 2023. I'm uh, delighted, as I said on social media, to have uh, some heavyweights of the industry joining us today. We have um, Andy Duckworth from eComplete. Paul, his colleague, uh, also from eComplete, both worked at the Hook Group, and they'll give more info on their backgrounds in a moment. Um, that's from a DTC aggregator. Adam is from uh, Boosted, um, Senior VP of M&A uh, at, a, at a, uh, an aggregator that looks at both FBA and DTC. Uh, Dustin Jones, recently rep, met, um, is at a, an aggregator of DTC brands and has a, has a very impressive CV. And Seth Broman, um, who's uh, part of Yardline, which is, which is part of Swiftline, and is uh, kindly sponsoring our DTC guide, is, is with us today and, and can touch on touch on uh, what was voted as the most important topic uh, for the next webinar, uh, uh, capital, capital needs. And um, that's, that's what Yardline is all about. Um, so great lineup. Uh, let's, let's jump in. Before, uh, so the way it'll work is um, all of those speakers and the Fortier group will give a short presentation. Uh, please submit questions as we go through via the Q&A tab on, uh, on Zoom, uh, not via the chat tab, that becomes unmanageable. Um, I and the other speakers will answer questions on, on the tab, but also then uh, bring up the most interesting questions live during the uh, Q&A session at the end, um, of which there will be plenty of time for discussion. So um, I'll kick off a presentation of just a, 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 a 10 or so slides over five minutes, and then we'll hand over to our, our first uh, speaker. So when we think about um, this topic, uh, we generally think that there's four key topics that influence valuation. And from a seller perspective, uh, our, our, our key clients that are sellers, um, they always bring it back sort of to valuation. So we wanna look at the sort of the four key components or factors that drive valuation. That helps us think about um, the outlook of M&A for 2023. So, uh, sorry, before I jump in. So there's four, there's four components. There's market conditions, there's e-commerce trends, brand metrics, the brand performance and deal dynamics. So it starts off macro, how are, how is the global e economic conditions? Then we look at sector, then it gets into micro looking at the brand itself. And then there's, there's deal dynamics, um, uh, such, as, such as competitiveness of the deal and so forth. So I want to I could talk all day about all these topics, but I want to just uh, give you a few examples um under each of these to help set the scene for the other um, uh, speakers today so from a market conditions perspective uh taking a step back what's happened um interest rates were artificially low really since the credit crunch back in uh, 2008 higher interest rates have frankly cooled the market for m a in in recent uh, months uh driving down both m a volumes and, and values and and, and and I think I think we we can all all agree to that. Um, in terms of actually evidence of that, the volumes of global M and A you know has declined, um, decent drop uh, year on year. But um, when you zoom in, actually, uh, it's it's more daunting. Q three was the worst quarter um, since since two thousand and eight. Um, uh, so the end to to last year was clearly on a downward momentum. Um, uh, I don't have the data yet for, for, for Q4, but one would expect it would be, it would be similar. Um, let's do, talk about some good news. Um, there was a survey done by Interlinks, a, a, a virtual data room uh, company um, that shows um, respondents who are mainly private equity and corporate buyers um, think that M&A volume should increase. And you know, I guess from their perspective, it's, it makes sense, right? It's a good time to be a buyer. Um, there will be there will be certainly value uh, to be obtained. Um, quite frustrating uh, that there's the market outlook is so uncertain. There's a really right, wide range of views. There is no consensus amongst all the big investment banks. 
Um, I used to work at Morgan Stanley. They're saying 3,900 for the, for the S&P by year end. Uh, but at the high end, you've got Wells Fargo and Deutsche Bank, you know, offering incredibly different um, predictions. So it's frustrating that there's not more of a tighter consensus. That means that does anyone really know what's going to happen this year? Um, um, and, and when will the impact be? Will it be H1 recession or is it H2? And when will, when will the recovery be? So where does that leave us? It means uh, it's hard to know from a market conditions perspective how we're going to tread through uh, 2023, which, which, which isn't helpful for talking about outlook. Uh, from an e-commerce perspective, the second factor, um, I, 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 you know, very simple chart, but I, you know, the, the party, the COVID party, um, has happened and the hangover I think we're all we're all you know we're all we've recovered from the hangover so to speak or, or the party's definitely ended um, and now it's back to normal um, the good news from an M&A perspective is that the likes for like for likes versus you know last year will be comparably better or easier to compare against um, and that will help both uh, individual brands and, and uh, aggregators. But certainly, there's some new aggregators which are starting fresh and, and uh, have a cleaner slate than some of the um, the, the pioneers. Um, another example of e-commerce trends that are that are that are helpful is you know the massive dip in the cost of shipping. It was you know nearly on well, it was unbearable for all the sellers in in the room listening to this. It was must have, it must have been incredibly tough uh, time in you know end of 2021. And for a good chunk of last year, thankfully, it's normalizing and that will help um, margins of brands and, and, and therefore hopefully M&A. Um, brand metrics is the third um, uh, category or factor. Uh, we could, again, talk about this all day, right? There's so many uh, uh, micro factors about the business, uh, the brand that are key to determining when to exit and what one might get from a valuation perspective. These are just some examples. This is not meant to be exhaustive, but obviously uh, revenue, by that we mean quantum of revenue is key. There are certain thresholds that earn you the right to approach um, a wider group of, of types of investors and, and, and different um, sophistication of investors. Revenue growth is obviously really critical. We, we don't take on clients um, at the Fortier Group that, that don't have revenue growth. We're not looking to uh, be an intermediary of distressed assets. We have to see revenue growth and um, net margins are obviously critical and uh, net margin trajectory is, is, is as important. Um, uh, certainly for FBA businesses, uh, we and our buyer clients want to see typically 20% net margins can be lower for, for DTC. Um, but the trajectory is really important. Uh, if it's a downward trajectory, you know, that's, that's obviously a tough, tough background. Um, so um, all of these, again, all of these points uh, are important to think about from a timing uh, perspective and, and ultimately, you know, valuation. Um, deal dynamics uh, aren't talked about that often from a, a timing and valuation perspective, but they're really, really important. Um, um, going back to the inter interlink survey, uh, some great data here. Um, what do buyers think will be the biggest uh, challenges to getting deals done? And probably no surprise, especially given we've just had a sort of a correction in the last for six to nine months. Um, the, the gap between uh, the seller's valuation expectations and what a buyer is willing to pay is, 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 is right up there. Um, and I, I, think, I think sellers are starting to be a bit more realistic. Um, uh, we certainly um, tell sellers our honest view as to where they think, where we think the deal will price. There are other competitors of ours that just tell sellers what they want to hear. Ultimately, that wastes a lot of time and can lead to a deal being brought to market twice, which which is 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 not helpful for the seller. So, we like to be honest and frank from a valuation perspective, and um, sometimes that can have mean you know tough discussions. But um, uh, ultimately, it's about getting a fair deal for both sides. Um, macroeconomic stock market volatility clearly, um, you know, volumes will be lower if we have more you know shocks uh, like we had um, uh, last year. Operational issues at target companies. Again, clearly, there's you know it's a tough context for e-commerce at the moment, uh, with softening demand from from uh, consumers generally, um, and um, uh, you know that can lead to that can lead to you know operational issues 
of all sorts. Um, so there's some there's some um, other points there. And for those who want to dive deeper, I'd encourage people to 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 look up this paper from Interlinks. It's it's um, it's an interesting read. Um, there's other ways to think about deal dynamics, right? So um, the highest valuations, uh, certainly in the Amazon FBA space, were probably um, the second half of 2021. And guess what? It's no surprise that um, supply and demand at that at that point in time, uh, the buyers had, were raising a, a, an incredible amount of funds and that had to be put to work. Um, that has changed over the last uh, year. Um, it's very tough for anyone to raise money in the capital markets. Uh, I mean, any sector, whether it's, and whether it's equity or credit, and you can see that through the bar charts as we as we as we bring it up to the most recent period. Um, again, ec equity is really tough right now. Credit is is tough, but 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 relatively easier than than equity. And um, I think the strong will survive. Um, there are a number of aggregators raising funding right now. But I think they have really clear niche messages and strategies and uh, you know touch wood for all of us um they will they will get the uh, the funding away and um, we'll continue to see uh, you know more capital being put to work that's not to say there's not there's not a lot of dry powder to put to work by no means has, have this, has the 15 billion dollars been spent um and there's other new aggregators coming to market um there's an aggregator out of new york which is coming out of stealth mode soon backed by uh, one of the leading private equity firms in the world and um, it's just um, uh, it's it's signing an LOI with us on one of our deals at the moment. So there there are there are um, there are green shoots as well. But um, the point here is that it's important to understand all of these background factors and drivers and under to because they all affect uh, deal dynamics, which ultimately affects timing and valuation. So from a valuation perspective, I want to show you two slides. Uh, the first is of publicly listed consumer good companies. And the second is of um, unlisted, not public e-commerce companies. Uh, the second slide is from ourselves, the Fortier Group, and this slide is from another corporate finance house. So I guess no surprise, the, the valuations of uh, publicly listed consumer good companies have declined. Um, they're typically valued on EV, EBITDA basis, um, similar for DTC, but some FBA businesses, as, as a lot of you will know, are based on an SDE basis, it's a seller discretionary earnings basis. Um, there are some exceptions. Some companies are on our multiple of revenue, particularly in the pet space, but by and large, um, EV EBITDA is the lead metric. Um, so you can see there that um, in 2022, the start of 2022, uh, uh, the average multiple was 12X, and that's come down to 8X. Um, by Q3, we don't have Q4 numbers um, at, at the moment. So, look, a, a, a significant drop given given everything we've discussed above in terms of market conditions, e-commerce, and uh, the consumer sector as a whole. So, what does it mean for um, unlisted, non-public DTC brands? Um, it, our range it, it is it is wide. It's wide for a reason um, because it is very hard to be. Uh, you know, scientific. There can be such variants of, the, of brands that we see, but let, let me let me talk you through it. So, before the correction, you know, April or so last year, uh, we were typically seeing um, DTC trades in the five x to twelve x. That includes both upfront comp consideration and any deferred component. Yes, there are always exceptions. That's, we're saying this is the typical range. So. Please, uh, please, please, please hear that loud and clear. There are always exceptions, both to the downside for distressed and to the upside where it is a complete home run. Um, generally, we, we've seen that range come down, obviously, similar to the prior slide of listed companies. Um, we, we see it as very, very wide because um, um, a more distressed company or, or a company that's gone X growth on top line or, or the net margin trajectory is declining will be towards the bottom end. Um, but to get to the higher end, if a business has high recurring revenue, if it's a larger brand, good revenue growth, uh, strong net margins, um, there is a, every ability to price towards towards um, towards nine x. Uh, we are in the market at the moment with a DTC brand that, on an upfront basis, will be at the very high end of, of, of that range. Um, so, so, so it can happen. Hopefully, that range will tighten um, as we go forward. But um, that that's where we are today. Okay, I hope that was helpful to sort of set the scene. And now 
we will jump across to uh, Dustin Jones uh, from Unified Commerce Group. Are you there, just Dustin? I am. I'm here. Thank you. Um, and and it's uh, nice to meet everybody here, those that are listening. Um, and uh, Emmett, I appreciate the opportunity to um, share with your group a little bit about what we're doing and <clears throat> happy to answer any questions. We, I may have a guest enter the room shortly during my presentation as we recently, uh, the guest is my newborn son um, uh, who uh, I committed to at 11.45 having with me. So, um, you know, uh, you'll see me to be able to present uh, in a dynamic way, but briefly, uh, we are a version of an aggregator. We are uh, at Unified Commerce Group aggregating what we call next generation fashion brands. Um, our thesis was, uh, and, and some of the slides that Emma is going to show, I, I decided to pull from 2020 when we raised our original um, rounds of capital. Our thesis was that one, there would be very, very few sub mega brands in the future, and, uh, and or, or mega brands in the future. And my experience having been and worked with Macy's for 15 years and then lived in China, uh, working with the Alibaba group over five years, I had the chance to see almost every brand that was built over the last uh, 20 years. And a lot of these brands, as they grew, were, be, were being given billion dollar valuations or what I would have called mega valuations. A lot of that driven by the D2C fury. And we went out and pitched this concept in 2020 that though D2C was booming, it would not boom forever. And that these we would move into a D2C 2.0 era, era where uh, there would be a different portfolio of brand driven by a different customer preference, and that, that's highlighted there, that there would be channel disruption, that these retail e-com dominated brands would experience valuation suppression. They would need to move into multi-channel distribution. And based on that valuation suppression, they would need to trade into different exit outcomes than they currently had in front of them. And they would not just need uh, that exit option, they would need uh, strategy, resources, tools, and enablers to help them get there. And that ultimately, um, they were, there would also need to be a lot of back-end tools uh, in order to stabilize supply chain, stabilize financials, and ultimately help them compete against uh, the technology that was rising and ultimately being uh, led by uh, larger scale companies that made it hard for smaller scale companies to compete in ever rising customer acquisition cost models. So, our pitch was that, that fashion would go the way the, of music, that the, the next generation of consumers, they would consume fashion like music and that music is consumed at today's Gen Z knows a 50s artist, a 70s artist and a modern artist all the same. They're listening to Fleetwood Mac and, and Taylor Swift in the same playlist and, and very much enamored by old and new. And, but the function of the available artists to them means that there will be less mega artists and more uh, artists that are that are sub mega. Same with fashion. There will be less billion dollar Tommy Hilfiger's and all bird billion dollar valuations and more sub mega uh, brands that uh, consumers consume fondly cross cultures and cross generations. And we wanted to build a company that empowered that that spent the last 18 months building the resources and tools that these companies would need. And we wanted to acquire our first brand to help us get our teeth wet and understand what was underneath the tent. So you can go to the next slide, Emmett. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we called this generation, Generation 2.0. And for UCG, it was, uh, which is the acronym of our company, uh, we said fast to scale was DDC 1.0, digital first, few category winners, but it's really centered around, around categorization. Uh, and 2.0 would look at like scale as a group, shared resources, Omnichannel first, which you can call it omnichannel, multi-channel, uh, multi-territory, so not in your single market or, or single country, and uh, by by function of that, a wider portfolio of win winners at smaller uh, ultimate scale. Uh, so if you'll go to that next slide, um, what we uh, what we looked at in, in in looking at the hurdles that these people faced which was you know, the brands that we were looking at, we call purpose-led brands. These brands are led by founders who are, are driven by conscious uh, awareness of their cause. They didn't wake up saying, let me build a billion dollar fashion enterprise. They had an idea, 
They created product behind it. They created a cult following behind it, which got bigger and bigger and bigger and ultimately got them to break through their first few glass ceilings. But by function of that, their characteristics um, are, are desirable, strong, loyal ambassadorship and loyal customers. They're not just a product. So we're not a product aggregator. They were a brand aggregator. They have strong product differentiation, however. There's uniqueness in what they do compared to the rest of the market. They have brand pop propositions that have global characteristics. In the case of our first brand, Frank and Oak, highly diverse, strong population of Asians, strong population of, uh, of uh, uh, multiple uh, demographics, strong Canadian, strong American. And they had proven digital channel capabilities in the sense that they had a strong data footprint that we could unlock but currently subscale. And what that meant is they were generally growth, but break even or just above break even. To break through where they needed to go, they needed more investment, more talent pools. Most of these brands had an A star on their team, but then most everyone else is C. Uh, they lacked technology resources to help them compete at the levels they need to, to really reduce CAC, improve LTV, extend reach. They needed to open new networks and channel distribution. They needed to be in new markets, but even if they had the capital to do so, the wherewithal to do so was, was light. And they had taken capital, almost everyone has taken capital, but a lot of that really wasn't empowering them uh, with their growth strategy. It was more just capital they needed at the time, or that capital had come at a high cost, such as venture capital. Um, and we can go to that um, next slide. Uh, and so this is just a, a profile um, of the, types of brands we're looking for. If anyone here knows them and wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to take a look. We've looked at hundreds of these brands. One of the reasons why we were so encouraged is that the pipeline is only getting bigger and bigger of brands that, that could be a part of our, our roll-up. Uh, and, and therefore, the opportunity to choose the top five to 10 uh, uh, was easier. And, and so, um, we look for 20 to 75 million. 20 is very on the, much on the low side. But if they have a really distinct product categorization, maybe a smaller market uh, like Canada, uh, that 20 can be more meaningful and or a high EBITDA uh, that makes that all, all of that mix more interesting. Um, we, these are sort of the areas we focus on. We, we call it an intelligent operating platform. We built first class omni-channel capabilities, first class data capabilities, first class automation and of distribution capabilities, first class financial uh, resources for them to used to automate the business, uh, first class HR tools that can help them strengthen and develop their talent. And all of that is a gift with purchase. We don't require anything for it. It's one of the value adds from joining and becoming a part of the group. Uh, and, and for that, we hope that then founders while building their brand will also empower our company and, and, and become brand champions of, of Unified Commerce Group as a parent company. I should note that we take majority ownership in, in and oftentimes we take 100% ownership and any ownership that we don't take generally rolls into UCG uh, equity. So to go back to Emmett's first point and one on the survey, um, negotiating between us and the founder, that synergy has to exist. And sometimes that is a function of limiting who, who we look at and who we don't look at. Uh, but the benefits, in, in my opinion, outweigh um, any of those decisions for one important reason, which is probably the most important uh, thing to have happened in late 2022 and early 2023. And that is, is that when we started this business, there were few founders that didn't believe that a very large exit wa uh, wasn't possible. Today, most founders don't believe in the exit. They don't believe that there's the big exit, the big check waiting for them. They believe that they've got another three to five years that they have to really row the, uh, that boat and the exit is, uh, is, is vague. And so we offer them an alternative exit, one where no matter how fast or how high their brand scales, it, they don't need to scale alone for us to win. Scaling as a group, becoming collaborators, which most millennial founders are, empowers the platform to scale at, an, at a multiple exit that is much more likely than a, a single vertical brand exit. Uh, Emmett, you can happily go to the next slide. So um, in, in, no, that's great. In summary, um, we've done uh, our first deal we've raised, and I'll be very open, we've raised about 32 million of capital. We have another deal we're closing right now. 
uh, and uh, and we've been uh, hotly uh, uh, followed by many of the private equity companies. We face the same challenges that everybody faces in raising capital, both debt and equity. Uh, we've been fortunate that uh, we have the companies that uh, we're buying are attractive companies and the company that we've built is an attractive brand. And we've been able to demonstrate in our first phase as, an, as, a, as a brand, our ability to lead these capabilities through. But we face the same market risks that everyone else faces, same concerns, and uh, we have to prove it day by day. Excellent, Dustin. Um, there's a question, can you give, uh, can you please give an example of a brand that you'd like to acquire? Could you maybe give some more color on that, please? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that uh, there's hundreds of these brands, but I'll use brands that, that I'd like to acquire. And if somebody wanted to convince the founder to sell to me, uh, I'd appreciate it. But there's a brand out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming called Steo. It, for those of you that don't know Steo, it's a, it's a very purpose-led, highly sustainable um, outdoor company that focuses on ski and, and outdoor adventure, very similar to Patagonia. Incredible product uh, differentiation, incredible uh, multi-channel footprint would be a great example of a brand that uh, we don't have in our pipeline today that we would like because brands we do have in our pipeline uh, we're under NDA with. Uh, and so uh, that would be a brand uh, example that I would get that squarely fits all of the profile metrics that we, we would look for. Very good. Well, Justin, thank you. I know you're, you're short on time with your, your son in the room. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you dialing in today. Yeah, no, appreciate the invite. Hope that was helpful to some. Yeah, thank you, sir. Excellent. Um, so we're going to uh, go from New York across the Atlantic to the UK, where we have... Um, Paul and Andy Duckworth uh, doing um, a joint presentation on behalf of eComplete. Over to you guys. Thank you, Amit. Um, shall I go first, Andy? You go for it. Uh, I'll quick intro. So, yeah, I am Paul Gedman. My background is nine and a half years at the Hook Group, mainly as the CEO of the beauty division. And with lots of help and several acquisitions along the way, we built that from 20 million of largely UK revenue to over 500 million of global revenue. And now uh, a founder of eComplete and very thankfully doing the job as co-CEO with Mr. Andrew Duckworth. And nice. eComplete is a e-commerce uh, e accelerator and investor. Cheers, guys. Hi, guys. Um, <clears throat> good to meet you all. Andy Duckworth, co-founder of eComplete. Um, back in the day, I ran the other half of the Hook Group with Mr. Gedman. So he ran the beauty division, I ran the health division, which was known really as my protein. Um, since then, I've founded as well a CBD and wellness brand called NatureCam. Uh, that will turn over around about 12 million in the last 12 months and is break even and trading in uh, 40 territories plus. So quite well qualified on the econ space from sort of the journey from, from zero to, to 12 and then from maybe 25 uh, million turnover to 350 million plus. So plenty of learnings and scars on the back uh, from those two journeys so far. Over to Geds. Cheers, mate. So yeah, when we were thinking about the topic for today and uh, thinking about the outlook and the trends for 2023, Obviously set off plenty of thoughts, but we thought most or many of those would be captured when we're looking at D2C brand startups, um, why they have collectively be, been gaining share, how they can build profitable revenue at an impressive speed, uh, but then rarely break past that 10 to 20 million of revenue mark. Um, we'll have a little look at the reasons we believe that trend continues, some of the common challenges whether we'll see more breakthrough to become larger e-commerce businesses in 2023, and then what is needed to become a global leader. So uh, will smaller D2C brands keep gaining share in 2023? E-commerce, as we all know, is dominated by larger players. But over the past three to five years, the smaller D2C brands have been uh, gaining market share, and they now account for about 20% of total e-commerce revenue. They've got many things in common, strong brand identity. They lead with ESG messaging, usually very on-trend product with a small product range, 
they're usually socially led and, and the majority of revenues in domestic markets. And, and as we said, they're, they're very often profitable as well. However, very few of these brands break into the 20 to 50 million range, and, and we see them struggle to maintain sales growth over a five-year period. If you don't mind moving us on, Emmett. So why don't smaller D2C businesses break out past the 20 million mark? Um, and, and will this be a trend in 23 where we continue to see uh, these brands with uh, a quick start out the blocks and good opportunity you know, continue to kind of fail to break through those glass ceilings? We know 2022 was a really tough year for most and especially the smaller D2C brands. So we're going to have a quick look at the challenges and the opportunities for the smaller D2C brands. Are they going to keep gaining market share? And then are we going to see this cohort break into the P investment space? So some of the opportunities that we, we think are going to be very prevalent in 2023, technology is continuing to advance. And that means there's more commoditized technology, which makes a lower cost and a global access available to, to many more people. And we see that obviously Shopify has been a real leader there, but now Shopify are breaking out into fulfillment, into marketing services and into actual financial lending. There's tools and products like that are going to help with data, such as Snowflake. So we really believe all those elements of technology and the commoditized nature, the low cost and the access to millions globally will continue to see the trend continue of these smaller D2C brands gaining share. Then when we look at the social and in the influencer reach, it's not going anywhere. And we're seeing real good growth on YouTube and obviously TikTok. Um, so we expect that again to keep being a supporting factor for smaller D2C brands to keep gaining share. And, and again, the fast feedback loop, what we've seen over the last year especially, is there's always been that fast feedback loop with social, but we're seeing lots of hype selling, which you know we've we've not seen as much before in in previous uh, in our previous years where products are launching and you're selling 10,000 units out in two or three minutes. Uh, so again, that social, that reach and that ability for many people to get access uh, quite easily at that smaller level is as easy for the bigger e-commerce businesses as well. And then artificial intelligence, it's probably going to be the breakthrough year where this again is going to be an enabler for small D2C brands to keep getting greater access to even more complex skills. So we'll have all heard about chat GPT-3. Uh, we think these kind of products and other similar AI tools are going to keep helping the smaller D2C uh, businesses have better access to content, to creative, to customer service, um, and to coding as well. So again, you know, real support that's going to help that trend continue. And, and data solutions, we think there's, we see many more were in this space ourselves we see many lower cost solutions uh, help inform data-driven decision making. We've got a product ourselves, which we've got in a kind of beta soft um, phase launch called eCompare, which allows businesses of any size actually, but to sign up and get context of their performance across many metrics of uh, revenue growth and CAC in different territories across different uh, a different marketing channels. So again, like we think there's lots of supporting factors that are going to help the D2C um, small businesses keep on taking share. But then we're going to look at some challenges on the next slide, if you don't mind, Emmett. So access to talent, um, it's always been uh, it's always been a, a tough uh, a tough ask in e-commerce, especially for small businesses. And we think um, real talent is rare and it's also expensive. We think there's an over-reliance on agencies. Um, we see most brands working with at least you know, one or, or if not more. And we really believe that when you start using agencies and give the, the power of that data insight and a strategy to third parties, you really lose an ability to move fast, be flexible and, and make those quick decisions on a D2C business. And then international growth challenges. So lots of key metrics that are essential to success and to avoid common mistakes. Um, and Andy touches on these in a bit more detail later, but you know it's essential that you've got a GP at a certain level and an average order value and uh, being able to actually afford in your p l to take advantage of the international access that e-commerce assets get. And, you know, we think it's really, really hard for people to understand what the best localized talent and partners are. It's, it's very much uh, a situation where you've got to learn 
as you go and and we're fortunate that we've got lots of scars on our backs uh, but it's uh it's it's not easy to get access to and then costs are increasing everywhere we say that 40 percent gross profit no longer works you used to be able to operate a e-commerce business making probably 10 percent EBITDA if your gp was at 40 percent we believe that no longer exists and, and that new line is at 50% GP. And that's just because every cost is increasing from uh, your ingredients cost to your fulfillment and your freight, your marketing cost um, and the cost of people obviously increasing. And then there's a real lack of capital that's available at the moment and, and that's certainly not available to these smaller brands. So again, there's plenty of challenges facing uh, the smaller DTC uh, brands and and our belief of them breaking out that 10 to 20 million, um, you know, it's quite hard for businesses to overcome all these challenges. And so how do small brands break through the various scale glass ceilings? So I'm going to hand over to Mr. Duckworth. Cheers, Gads. Uh, next slide, if we would, please. Um, yeah, so, so definitely not an exhaustive list, uh, just some learnings from my own experience and, uh, particularly on the left hand side, you know, some some aspects within that that you know I've been working on within NHCAM uh, with the team in the last sort of two or three years and sharing those. So one aspect would be always look to optimize what you've got. I think every business, well, every business has data, but it's how you use it, how you can format it, uh, triangulate it. So bring in your marketing, your customer service. Um, your products, your supply chain, align all that, get one source of the truth, and then be able to present that data clearly to all your staff so they can use it, interpret it, and make the right decisions from it. So clearly the quality of your staff or the talent within the business is hugely important as well. And you need the guys to be able to execute upon this data. Uh, so again, just collect it, uh, present it clearly, uh, You know, using a good tool, and with the guys who can interpret it, they can execute upon it. And I'll touch upon on the right hand side here in a minute, you know, what that means. Uh, but in simple terms, you know, you need to be doing less of the bad stuff, more of the good stuff. You'll be surprised what goes on, you know, in any business, you know, sub 10 million, including the, you know, the ones that I've run, uh, where people, you know, can make the wrong decisions. And if you've got your data clearly verified uh, and presented, then you can make more, more of the right decisions, less of the wrong ones. So the once you've got your business optimized, and, and that might be the difference of 10 million turnover between making 500k and 800k or a million quid. Um, on the right hand side, how do you take that business you know, further um, and get it from that 10 million maybe to the 50 or 100 or 150? Um, there's various ways of doing it, but one way might be globalization. Now, how do you approach globalization? From, from my learnings, you'd be looking at a gut feel of the product that you've got. You know, presumably, if you're the founder of a business or a CEO, you believe in that product that you've got. You believe it's a great product and you can take it to further relevant markets. Now, data might tell you this, where you're starting to do sales or you're starting to get traffic from other markets. And that is one sort of hint of, yeah, we can get it into these markets and, and scale the business. Now, how you do that, Will depend on the product metrics that you that that your business presents itself with. So whether that's the average order value or the AOV, you know, and the GP that you've got to play with on each sale, you know, massively important. And then there's other factors as well, like the cube of the products or the weights or the dims, and then the labeling. And do you have to do a cross border um, sort of offering, or do you can you put the product directly into the market? you know, without changing the label and, and, and do a local fulfillment solution. So the, the capital as well in your business might determine that. Obviously, if you're offering local fulfillment, you need more capital. You might need to take a chunk of your stock or replicate that and put it in the local market. Um, so again, these are all the considerations that as a CEO or as a founder, you know, you've got to, you've got to think about. Now, again, in terms of scaling a business, it will come down to the quality of your people experience cl clearly helps now that everyone's got the experience straight away so you need that mix of you know mix of I guess exuberance and people who have done it before but I do think it's important to try and avoid the mistakes for a second or third time if I could pick one special secret sauce of any sort of skill set it would be local marketing expertise so again it goes back to your people and if you can get that local marketing cut through from your product 
I think you've got a good chance of success. So local marketing, local expert talent, you know, takes a lot of setting up and infrastructure and, and all that sort of like. Now, the other point you need to consider, of course, is the brand protection. So there's no point in growing your business and devaluing it by doing a poor job you know, of your of your globalization. So you need to be thinking about the trademarks that you need, the domains, protecting your IP, and then as you grow, offering world-class customer service in the local markets and having the right third-party logistics, you know, if that's the way you're going to go, to make sure the growth that you're delivering is valuable growth as opposed to value destroying growth because if you go into a market and do a poor job you know i'd argue you put your business is then worth less not more and it's going to impact your trust trust pilot and all that sort of malarkey now just winding back and it's something uh dustin touched on as well you know the challenge is as a ceo as a founder is can you deliver valuable growth what's the cash balance do i want the dilution can i get the debt as a founder of a, of a note to 10 million business or of a 10 to 20 and there's varying lending mechanics that you can lean on as you go through the, the sort of the growth scale, the growth process, if you will. And I think that's the conundrum you, you face as a founder. Now, just the final thought for me is that if you can survive in the current climate and have a profitable business, then you've probably got a very good business as we wind out of this current macroeconomic climate. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Paul. Uh, if, if you have questions for, for both of those gentlemen, please uh, submit them via the Q&A tab and we'll come to them during the panel session. Um, okay, so we're going to cross back across the Atlantic to Seth in New York. Welcome, Seth. Thanks, Emmett. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Seth Broman. I am the Chief Revenue Officer at Yardline. Um, Yardline is an e-commerce focused uh, capital marketplace where we help connect e-commerce sellers with different financial tools relevant to uh, each specific business need and um, help them scale their business. Uh, Yardline uh, is a spin out from Thrasio, so we're very familiar with the acquisition side and often work with sellers going through um, the acquisition process. Um, we're also owned by SwiftLine, which is on the acquisition side. Um, as well in the uh, tech sector. So more focusing on e-commerce SaaS enablement tools um, and other e-commerce tech companies. Um, let's jump in. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, and as been uh, mentioned a few times already, um, the, the, the main struggle for e-commerce sellers today is really um, growing their business or understanding whether or not they're at a position where they want, want to exit um, for the valuation they're seeking. And so um, having access to capital and in, in, in all different forms really will help guide that seller down the path of being able to grow the business profitably if they're earlier on, um, or if they're at the stage where they're already um, speaking with uh, potential acquirers about the business, um, really getting to a point where the business is that much, uh, well, well, first and foremost, at the point where um, it's peaking for them. Um, granted, the, the aggregator or the acquirer would look to continue that growth, but they've taken the business to the point where um, maybe they feel they can't grow it any further, or maybe they you know, feel it's their time to move on. Um, but also um, in a position where the, uh, the acquirer wants to then take the business and continue to um, grow it themselves. And so we look at different, um, different financial tools as different um, products, whether you're earlier on looking to continue to scale your business and grow the business. Um, it's been mentioned a bit that um, equity investments have really dried up on the on the debt side. It's been getting tougher. It's been more challenging. Um, some of the revenue-based financing companies in the space have pivoted. We started um, as a direct funder of revenue-based financing and made the decision in early 2022 and, and, and um, continued on with that into, into 2023 to pivot away from a direct originator and really focus on helping connect sellers with the products that fit their needs because that was a big missing uh, part of the equation. And so um, as we've seen some of these revenue-based financing companies either raise prices or tighten up across the board or even stop originating altogether, um, it's important for e-commerce sellers and, and all different uh, small businesses to be able to connect directly with the products that are, are best for them. And, and those aren't so easy to find in this market. Um, and if you put yourself in the position of being a seller, if you are a seller, um, it's challenging to really understand what's real and what's not real out there. And, um, you know, you're not going to want to go through the process of applying with 
you know, three, five, 10, or even more different companies. And so um, what we've done is we've been able to use our one single application to help connect those uh, e-commerce operators with um, many, many different um, funding products and lenders in the space. And so um, if you're in a position where you're, you're, you're right now earlier on and looking at um, growing your business and getting to the point where you can get it to the point where you want to do, you know, make an exit, um, you know, often you're, you're looking at lower cost options, longer term options. Um, so you're, you're, you're not um, in a position where so much of your revenue is going to pay back a revenue-based financing company. Um, perhaps a, an unsecured small business loan that may be, um, you know, repaid over 12 to 24 month terms or an SBA loan that goes out, um, you know, up to 10, 10 years um, would be the right type of product to help you um, get off the ground or launch a new product or maybe even acquire a competitor um, if you're if you're in a position to do so. If you're at the point now where you're thinking about making that exit, um, you know, and you really want to start having conversations, one thing we found very effective with some of our customers is, um, you know, increasing their spend around marketing um, and, and, and in turn needing to have more inventory on hand to drive more traffic. And maybe it's at a lower SDE if you're an Amazon seller or EBITDA um, as a D2C company, but being able to drive more top line will effectively, um, you know, increase your bottom line as well and put you in a position to sell at a higher, uh, higher amount. Um, and, and for those types of, you know, um, needs, we, we would often recommend someone go with a product like a line of credit. Um, if you're spending more on marketing, I, I would hope you're using a credit card instead of, you know, tapping into your cash or using Amazon directly to your, your Amazon, uh, disbursements to directly fund those marketing expenses. But, um, you know, there are different reasons why you would want to use different products. Um, you know, a line of credit for the most part, they're typically revolving lines that, um, you can use today, spend more money on marketing, um, generate those sales tomorrow and pay it down and only have to pay for the financing as long as you have it uh, outstanding. Um, and, and then one last thing that we really focus on with businesses that are looking to exit is making sure that you're, you're not in a position where you're taking your foot off the gas or even stepping on the brakes. Um, it's happened plenty of times where, you know, over the last you know few years that we've been running Yardline, we've been working with a seller that um, is planning an exit um, and they stop buying inventory or they stop spending on advertising as they plan to exit the business. And, and the, the acquirer at that position is looking at a business that has um, not enough inventory or, or decreasing sales. Um, and so, you know, similar products, revenue-based financing, where you're only paying for the financing as long as it's outstanding, um, or a line of credit may be a good way to help um, buy short-term inventory. So when a, a potential acquirer or aggregator is looking to take over the business, they feel more comfortable knowing that there's more inventory on the way or already um, landed, and they don't have to worry about buying a business today and spending the next 30, 60, 90 days waiting for inventory to show up. Um, that's just some high level, um, you know, bullets to, to focus on, you know, or to think about as you're considering an exit. Um, but of course, you know, I think now more than ever, it's really about being able to connect with different um, debt providers and being able to um, understand the pros and cons of each product. Uh, let's jump ahead to the next slide to talk about that just a bit. So, you know, through, through our single application, as I mentioned, um, you know, a, a seller has access to um, these products and more. Um, the, the big difference is that many of these funding providers are really focused on e-commerce businesses. So they understand e-commerce businesses inside and out. Um, it's not strictly financial underwriting. It's not strictly um, bank data underwriting. It is looking at how you're operating your business and how sellers are able to um, drive to the bottom line and service the debt and, and what the longer term strategy is than say, um, you know, maybe a traditional bank underwriting or even a, a FinTech underwriting that we see today. Um, rates are going up. They have been continuing to go up. Um, some of the e-commerce focused companies that were offering very, I don't wanna say cheap plans, but inexpensive programs have, have been um, suffering quite a bit. Um, losses are up across the board. Um, and so you, you've seen that they're increasing rates. In addition to that, you're seeing you know, the Fed the, here, at least in the U.S., has been raising rates um, and globally rates have been going up. So um, that all trickles down at some point. But, um, you know, at that point, it becomes a trade off of what's what's the benefit to you as an operator between, um, you know, maybe spending a little more for the capital that you would have gotten earlier or not taking on debt at all. 
Um, and lastly, on the last slide, we could talk just for a second about um, what our application process is and what we offer. So um, as I mentioned, one single application gets you access to all those products. Um, over 90% of our applicants are looking for financing to buy more inventory and spend more money on marketing. Um, we do offer ranging from $5,000 up to $20 million. Um, typically, you would be approved in as little as 24 hours. And today, the lowest rate APR product we offer um, is, is 9%. That's on a SBA loan, and it looks like they will be continuing to go up. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to borrow, um, I think in this economy right now, the longer you wait, the more you're going to pay. Um, but of course, you know, as competition continues to grow, um, we see other other companies coming out and offering better better products. So um, happy to answer any other questions if there are any on uh, the financing of your business. But um, if you do need anything, please reach out directly to Seth at SwiftLine.com. Thanks, Emmett. Thank you, Seth. And uh, given that the capital financing is the topic of the next webinar, I'm sure hopefully we'll have Seth back in a month's time to go into more detail we, alongside others. Um, but if you have any questions about capital as a way to grow, please do submit them via the Q&A tab and we can address them uh, in, in a moment. Uh, so our last speaker before we go to the panel and Q&A is Adam Epstein from uh, LA. He's the Senior VP of M&A at Boosted. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Emmett, and <clears throat> glad to meet everybody here. Um, I am the bad student of the group. Unfortunately, I uh, was one of the the last panelists that didn't have time to put together a presentation, but um, Boosted Commerce is uh, a aggregator, we don't love the term, but rolling up small Amazon and DTC businesses um, focused primarily on Amazon. We've got into about 37 brands at the moment doing nine figures of revenue um, and continue to, to look for other acquisitions. Uh, I was going to focus today a little bit on you know, the market over the last three years and, and where we see 2023 going. I think it's important to talk about the previous two years before getting into 2023 to kind of set the stage of why we are where we are today. Um, so starting in 2021, I like to call it the year of acquisitions. I think Thrasio uh, was got a, a very high valuation and a lot of aggregators kind of came in on the back of that, seeing the opportunity in particular with COVID where everybody was moving into e-commerce. So you saw $2 billion come into you know, the aggregator market from different, um, different groups from venture capital all the way to private equity. And it was a bit of a land grab. People were trying to grow as quickly as they can to get to scale and continue to you know, use that capital and, and get, to the, get to the size where um, you can continue to see those valuations increase and grow. Um, I think COVID obviously was a help for that. Everybody move from brick and mortar um, to not going out during quarantine and, and going online. I always love to use my mom as an example who had never even been on Amazon, started buying everything on Amazon because it got shipped to the house and she didn't have to go out into the world where, uh, where COVID was, was frequent. Um, so on the back of all that, uh, the market got quite saturated. A lot of people came in. I think at one point there were close to 100 aggregators who were looking to um, to continue to buy businesses. Uh, moving into 2022, you saw COVID bumps start slowing down. And I think where people get this wrong is e-commerce was still growing. I think e-commerce passed a trillion dollars for the first time in the history of mankind, um, but it was just going back to pre-pandemic levels. So Emmett showed that slide, which I actually almost used. Um, which showed the, the big spike on growth, and it's still growing. It just kind of came back down to, to the levels before, before COVID was there. Uh, so I like to call 2022 the year of indigestion or focusing inward um, as people slowed down their acquisition growth, given that, uh, you know, that COVID bump had gone away. Uh, it takes time to consolidate a lot of businesses. When you're buying you know, 20, 30 businesses in a year, some people are going as quick as two to three a week. Um, how do you put those all together? How do you focus your team on it? How do you make one plus one equal four um, and, and learn about each of these businesses? Each of these businesses is unique. You know, FBA in particular has a lot in common, but each one also has their own aspects that you really need to learn and understand. Um, on top of that, inventory was a huge problem as people were forecasting for that COVID bump to continue. So you saw a lot of inventory come in a lot of capital be tied up in that inventory. 
Um, your days on hand got to extreme levels. Storage costs got crazy as Amazon continued to um, to increase their fees. You know, 3PLs were necessary where they probably weren't before. And uh, the shipping that Emmett talked about was slowing down, but was still there. So all of that's going on. People are trying to figure out how to kind of consolidate their businesses. And on top of that, the capital started to slow down um, where, you know, uh, FBA aggregation or even e-commerce aggregation, I think was, um, you know, the bell of the ball for a bit and kind of went the other way for a little while where uh, it became almost a, a four letter word for, for a bit there. Um, while that was all going on, I think the aggregators in themselves also started to focus in on specific categories versus being generalists. And that is really where you can make a differentiation uh, trying to you know, provide alpha for your businesses in, in scaling them. Um, there was a bifurcation where the best businesses continue to see uh, acquisitions and, and see decent multiples where some of the lower businesses saw the multiples kind of fall out from under them or weren't able to, to really sell at all. Um, and then finally, there was a focus on, on brands versus products, you know, which I think is a, a big uh, player here in particular, as you think about omnichannel, if you have a product on Amazon, you know, you can sell, but it's going to be hard to scale in particular for a company like ours, where um, you, you need to get pretty big in order for it to make a difference in a hundred million dollar plus portfolio. So that leads us to, to 2023 and where we are today. And the purpose of this, the outlook, um, I think 2023, there is still opportunity, but it's also going to be a bit of a year of survival and focusing, continuing to focus inward and, and make the best of the opportunity. Capital is tight, interest rates are rising. Um, as people have mentioned previously, you know, there is some debt available, but equity is getting harder and harder and the valuations have come down. Um, that being said, this market is an incredible market um, for people to make money um, because you know, some of these businesses continue to scale. They've just, they haven't been, uh, they don't see the same valuation. The public markets are the best place to look to see this, right? All, all the DTC business in the public markets have gotten crushed already. Um, just to name a few off the top of my head, Rent the Runway was down 90%. Warby Parker was down 70%. Grove Collaborative was down 95%, all, all within the, the DTC categories. Um, and it's really a focus on, on profitability and year-over-year -year comps versus just scaling. Um, profitability is going to become super important as you're going to have to be a standalone business with capital not as available to, to fund that growth. Uh, year over year comps also are, are super important. A lot of people saw downturns coming off of 2021 with the COVID bump. 2022 should be a little bit easier to comp to given it's back to those normal levels, but how can you continue to provide additional value to your businesses? Um, and then I think that the last trend that's gonna happen in, in our kind of category is the consolidation of consolidators which Emmett had as one of his topics. Um, scale is important in particular when you add the SGNA associated with it. So who's gonna merge? It, it's already starting to happen. We're seeing people come together. And um, what's, what's the focus gonna be? You know, There's certainly non-core brands at each aggregator that don't really fit the thesis. What's gonna happen with those? And how are those gonna play off as well? And then what does that mean for people who are operating who are looking to be acquired? I think, uh, for good businesses, there's still going to be a market. I think scale is also becoming important. Uh, the two to three hundred thousand dollar EBITDA businesses are seeing their multiples drop a lot quicker than the two to three million dollar EBITDA businesses because, you know, again, at a hundred million dollars of revenue, two to three million dollars can make a difference. Where two hundred thousand is a lot of work for for a small return for that scale. Um, so, what would I do as you know an operator? I think margins and cash flow are, are super, super important in this market. Um, how can you get rid of some fat, even if it's you know at the cost of some top line? Well, we are solely focused on bottom line at the moment. So if you're gonna have a million dollars of revenue come in, but that's gonna be at a negative margin, um, that might be time to save that for the future. I know that's not everybody agrees with that, but I think that's how we're looking at things. Um, you've seen public companies have significant rifts in the last you know, three to four months, 10,000, 15,000 people at a time for some of the larger ones. Um, and then be, be an expert in your category rather than kind of going wide and far. If you're focused on baby, how can you, you know, get baby products and, and expand within those categories versus looking at 
uh, the kitchen as, as a second place. That is really where um, people are turning to focus. We are focused on, on beauty, food, and supplements as our categories. There's a few on baby, there's a few on home, but it really is kind of a, a specific niche where most aggregators are focused and find the right, the right partner for you. Um, and then I think the last thing that's important is a lot of aggregators are, are looking for that low-hanging fruit and uh, people think that they need to have a perfect business to go out. It's not necessarily true. We actually love to look for businesses where there is a strong foundation, but we think that Boosted has you know, a, a marketing technique or a new product technique or something that is available to help the business. Um, if your business is perfect, it, it's not going to be as great of a, a sign for us because that makes it harder to, to find that exponential growth that we're looking for when, when we buy a business. So to sum it all up, I think 2023 really do need to focus on uh, profitability and, and growth on year over year comps, um, trying to find that extra kind of lever is probably something to save for the future once the market comes back, given capital is pretty tight at the moment. Thank you, Adam, for those insights. Um, so let's jump straight to the panel and maybe, uh, Adam, if I can continue with, with you, um, if the other panelists could kindly turn on their, their, their speakers um, or their videos, please. Um, there's a question there from Joseph. Uh, do you believe Amazon will redesign their fees to help the 3P? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I think Amazon as a change from Bezos has happened, has become more focused on today versus the future. And part of that is fees and becoming more profitable. So 3P is huge for them. Um, it's more than 50% of their business. They don't have inventory that they have to hold on to. At the same time, uh, they are starting to suck margins out of their sellers. You know, 40% was, or 50% was a new 40% from a previous presentation in our business, you know, 80% is the new 70% because Amazon is taking 15% marketplace fees, storage fees, et cetera. They're mm -hmm. taking about half of your revenue by the time you, uh, you get through their FBA business. So they are going to continue to increase their fees. How do you offset that with prices? How do you offset it other ways? That being said, 3P is a, a big part of their business and they don't want to piss off their sellers too much. So they're trying to find that right balance. Um, not sure they found it yet, but certainly working on it. Mm. Um, question to the eComplete guys. Do you see yourselves doing more deal volumes this year versus last year? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly gearing up to do so. Uh, I think we're two years in now, and our first year was very much building our products and services to, to demonstrate that we could uh, do what we were talking about with, with an eComplete. Our last year has been about proving those with clients. We've got 36 clients now. We've done a couple of acquisitions. We've got lots of case studies, and our, our acquisition is probably the best case study, thankfully. Um, it's a, it's in a real acceleration of revenue. It's a really high quality asset anyway in the beauty device category of, with current body, but it's seen a real acceleration um, since, thankfully, since we've owned it and been helping out here and there. It's increased its international participation. It's increased its um, own brand participation. And again, thankfully, how we like to operate, um, EBITDA is growing well ahead of sales. So that tees us up very nicely. Um, and we're out in the market um, raising capital and, and looking for more assets. We think we've got the scale now to be doing two, three or four a year. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly uh, that is the aim this year. Great. Um, Seth, it's obviously incredibly difficult to raise equity right now. Um, that's being polite. Uh, it's, it's nearly impossible for an e-commerce company to raise equity right now, certainly of a decent size. Um, uh, clearly, there's some other options open. Um, are you seeing? Are you seeing in your uh, your inbounds or your and your prospecting? Is is that, um, are people still looking for equity sources? Or are they are they because it's effectively a closed door, willing to you know be more open to the different type, types of credit? Yeah, it's very case by case. You're, you're finding a lot of sellers that are in a tough spot that are limited on options that would love to bring in an equity investment. Um, we're finding um, businesses that have levered up 
it, mostly in anticipation of what was happening um, during COVID to continue, um, that are now sort of in a position where they have nowhere to go because they have you know more debt servicing than they have free cash flow, and so um, it, it puts these these businesses in a bind now. Um, certainly, we see plenty of sellers that would love to exit today. Um, we, we speak to plenty of sellers that have, um, you know, um, regrets about not exiting when they thought they should have or could have. I think everybody's probably um, hearing a lot of those stories. But um, the businesses that are looking for debt today, um, it's really understanding what they want to do with the capital and what the plan is. If it is um, you know, bringing on debt to get to an exit, that's certainly a lot different than somebody that's in a growth stage that um, needs more cash on hand because the demand for their products continues to grow and they need to continue to finance, um, you know, the manufacturing of those products and, and, and the marketing of them. And so um, it, it's very case by case, but certainly it's tough. It's more challenging now than it was two years ago um, to be able to scale your business using debt. Um, and of course, exiting now is, is is way more challenging than it was in this time, you know, 2021. And maybe we're seeing more distressed exits on the DTC side. Um, Andy, maybe you can comment to this. Um, you know, if the VCs aren't uh, are getting out of e-commerce to some extent, uh, does that mean in your prospecting you're seeing a lot more companies, uh, you know, maybe fast track or look at their exit earlier than they would have anticipated because they can't get equity to continue to grow? Yeah, you're definitely going to see that this year. I think it's a bit of a shame for some founders and you know guys who have worked hard in the businesses, but ultimately that is where it's heading. And I think you know it's something speaking free complete. It's something we're keen to help businesses with. You know, really good partners. Um, it's important that the guys currently in there still have skin in the game and can see an exit longer term. You know, you want, I think yourself, one of the panelists mentioned some founders can no longer see an exit, uh, which was quite sad to hear. Um, and I do think we've got the tools at eComplete, you know, with looking at the data, looking at the opportunities to globalize and, and kickstart businesses from, you know, whatever, 10, 20 million onto the 50, 60, 70 and provide that expertise and past knowledge of, of bringing a business back into you know, back towards scale. Um, <clears throat> and then businesses that do get through that, you know, it's clearly as we come out of it, this this environment, I do think there will, there will be better businesses. Again, you you demonstrate with the freight cost, for example, um, you know, ocean. Uh, it takes a, a more degree, a higher degree of planning to use ocean versus air. And we've all gone through that, that type of journey. And it depends on the types of goods. But I do think these type of costs, you know, in the next four or five years are going to come back into line and businesses that maybe are dropped into single digit um, EBITDA percentages or even lower, you, know, you can get them back towards the 10, 11, 12% and, and, you, and you're back to having a really decent business. And if it's doing 50 to 100 mil, you know, back into sort of the value game. Mm. So from a seller perspective, you know, there, there'll be hundreds of sellers watching this webinar over the coming months. Um, well, what are the top pieces of advice uh, you would give them um, as they think about either A, should they sell in 2023, and B, if they do sell, what, what sort of metrics should they be showing showing buyers? I mean, Adam touched on profitability and cash flow, which, which, which I agree on, but I maybe to ask this question to each of you, um, you know, uh, if you're a seller, would you, would you sell? Would you, if you had your own brand, would you sell in 2023, A, and then B, you know, what, what should they be putting forward as sort of the key KPIs or investment highlights in, in their in their SIM or, you know, confidential information memorandums? Yeah, I'm happy to go first on that. So I think in terms of you might be a forced seller, you know, let's be realistic and you might need the cash. Now, to me, it, it all sits within the commercial due diligence and, and looking at the numbers, you know, that that you get through an econ business properly and, and understanding, you know, where the slowdown is. You know, if, if the costs have crept up, and you, you know, that is something that may or may not be temporary or permanent. Whereas if the growth is slowing down because the demand is not there, that's a bigger issue. And, and that's when I always look at back to the internationalization um, possibilities. Many businesses look at getting into Asia, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that's not available, you know, particularly in an FBA type situation with Amazon. So if you can take a business and have great success in Asia, then you change the game for your business, in my opinion. And you know the population of Asia 
and the propensity for Western brands to do really well over there if they're set up right and if they're, if they're of sufficient quality. But to set a business up, you know, via Tmall or via direct to consumer into Japan, South Korea and the like, it does come with a lot. I think you need expertise to do that. Um, and again, it's something that we do offer at Ecomplete and we've got a track record of taking, you know, brands into Asia. We were very lucky with our first investment in terms of they already had a great team in their current body and they've executed that. So that's great. Um, but certainly in terms of looking at the metrics of that business, um, it was a business that we felt uh, you know, we wanted to invest in. Uh, you know, we got on very well with the senior management team, and and that senior team is still still there doing a great job. So we believe again, a point of differentiate differentiation for us is keeping you know the senior team in there. You know, and and helping where appropriate, or if they don't need it, even better. Uh, so yeah, that that would be my thoughts on that. Who'd like to go next? Happy to go. Yeah, I, I, I'll jump in there. I think I think um, you know one thing Andy mentioned there is, that we're we're very vocal about is if you're looking to grow and scale your business, going omnichannel is a must, um, and and it's something that you can't just force. You can't just do it. Um, you know we've seen a lot of you know folks in the aggregator space and 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 sellers individually trying to take uh, you know an FBA business as an, exa as an example to. Uh, to D to C and 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 it not work and and so there's there's ways that you can do it successfully. Obviously, it's definitely product driven and brand driven, but um, you know certainly there are vendors in the space that can help a brand go from FBA to D to C or go from Amazon um, US to to Europe or or, or other markets. But um, that that's a must, especially if if you're in a position right now of trying to buy time and wait for multiples to come up and and other things. Um, to be more in your favor through an exit, um, I, I, I think that's important. The other thing is, you know, as Andy mentioned, the creep of of cost to operating your business and 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 really getting a good understanding of what is not going to come back down and what is there for the long term. And if it's there for the long term, um, you know, and and you're at a position where there's such strong margin compression that um, it's not going to be um, an interesting acquisition, then you're going to either have to raise pricing or or do something differently because. Um, certainly, um, you know, being in a position where um, there's no cash flow from selling a product will not be interesting to anybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Adam, and then we'll go to um, Paul. Yeah, I, I agree with both Seth and Andy. Um, I think the one caveat I would have to, to Seth's in our, in our case, we actually split up our brands uh, to the point he made. Not not every product is made to be a DTC product, right? You have to have your um, you have to find your own customers and you have to have them come into your website, which, you know, that goes to the branding side. I think everybody's talked about it a little bit more. You need to be able to, to withstand your own customers versus Amazon has millions of customers coming to you. Um, so a hundred percent agree that those are ways to grow. Um, one thing that I think is, is super important. And Emmett mentioned this when he's talking to his, um, potential clients, People are kind of still looking at 2021 and 2022 and saying, shit, I missed out on that, you know, that multiple. Um, unfortunately for, you know, for sellers and fortunately for us as buyers, um, those multiples are down and it's it's going to be very hard if you're kind of set on looking at the 2021 numbers to get that multiple. Um, it's not impossible, but it is it is very hard and you have to have a pretty unique business in order to get anywhere close to that. Um, how do you get to that unique business? I think not only product differentiation, but a story around it is important. You know, what makes your brand a brand? Um, margins, everybody's talked about. Um, having a bit of that omni-channel presence certainly helps from a multiple perspective. Having international presence certainly helps from multiple perspective. Um, and then there's certain categories right now, if I'm gonna be honest, that are more in favor than others. Uh, baby is very hot right now for one for example pet is very hot right now is another. Um, so you know it, it's not the time to sell for everybody I do think um, it is a individual by individual perspective um, I think sitting here and waiting for multiples to come back is also not necessarily the right way to think about things right it's more about where you are with your business it's the right time for you to sell um, and getting the best value you can for for where you are mm -hmm. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Paul, to finish. Yeah, so I think it's clear that there's going to be more forced sellers this year than than there has been, and and it's going to be unfortunate for some, and and going to provide more opportunity potentially at much lower um, multiples than we've seen before. But I think 
Ecom generally has been too easy for too long, especially in that smaller D 2 C space that we talked about. And we're quite fascinated in that space because there's so many brands that quickly go from that two to 10 million. And when I say, you know, it's almost been too easy, you know, that that commoditization of technology is brilliant. It facilitates your ability to, you know, get off the ground quickly. Proliferation of social allows anybody to reach millions of customers quite quickly if you're an individual or or you're um, you know a big enterprise business. But fundamentally, people have got to start looking outside. And if you can survive, you've just got to tuck in, you know, and and like kind of forget the ego. Ecoms, you know, it ends up being plenty of egos because growth's been out there and it's it's been too easy for too long. Mm-hmm. But again, the benefit of ecom is we can be flexible. We can change path. We can change strategy. And, you know, again, we're, we're not trying to come across as smarter than anybody else at all, but we see a real kind of lack of, a, of appreciation for data insight in businesses. And, if, you know, people, again, take a step back and, and look at the data that's within that business, um, you know, that they're running. There's loads of opportunities that will be in most D2C businesses mm. once you know, people start uh, start looking away from that easy um, cost of acquisition across social and CAC. We don't believe CAC's coming down anytime soon, you know, in, in social and, and paid channels. So it's a real time for people to have a, a little shift tuck in and, and re-strategize and look at some of the more boring traditional channels that are typically free, that we typically love, <laughs> but certainly aren't cool. Hmm. Very good, uh, uh, Paul. And thank you uh, to all the panelists for today's discussion. Um, the recording will be made available uh, in the coming days, and um, uh, let's see. Let's see where we are. Uh, we maybe we can regroup in January twenty twenty four and uh, and see how this this year has gone. It's going to be interesting. Thank you all for your time. Take care. Have a lovely day.